Espanol, lo siento, so I'm also, like Toria, going to be giving this presentation in English. So I am going to be talking about building bridges with effective DevOps, uh, not the architectural sort of bridges. I am not an architect, but rather I'm going to be talking about creating connections in between teams and in between people. So my name is Catherine Daniels. You can find me around the internet as Beer Ops. I complain about computers on Twitter a lot. Uh, I am a senior operations engineer at Etsy. Toria did such a good job of describing Etsy, I'm just going to skip that. Uh, I also wrote, uh, co-wrote Effective DevOps from O'Reilly, which the official animal now of DevOps is the unshaven yak. So if you find yourself wondering why you're doing so much yak shaving in your day-to-day -day life, this is why it's O'Reilly's fault. So I'm really excited to be up here talking to you all today. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. One of those reasons is that I realized that I have now been in the tech industry 10 years, and 10 years is actually kind of a significant milestone. Um, 10 years is the so-called mid-career point by which 56% of women have left the tech industry. Now, I don't bring this up to be super depressing at the end of the day. That's not really what I'm here for. But I think it's important that when we are at events like this, when we're thinking about our industry and its future, we think about who is being included. Who is a part of these conversations? Who's getting to participate and who isn't? Now, I just hit the 10-year mark. Like That's pretty exciting for me. But there were definitely several years when I came really, really close to quitting. Not just leaving individual jobs or individual companies, but kind of table flipping and leaving the industry entirely. And a big part of why came down to the fact that I felt really, really disconnected from the part of the industry around me. Dr. Christina Maslach is a researcher who has done a lot of research and investigation into the topic of burnout. And she has identified these six key areas where if there is a disconnect or a mismatch in between a person and their workplace, that this can greatly contribute to burnout. So when people think about burnout, they often think about workload, having too much work to do and you just get really busy and stressed out. This can definitely contribute to burnout, but if everything else in your job is going really well, if you just have a lot to do and you're really busy, you might still be really excited about that. That doesn't necessarily mean you're burned out. You might find that you don't have enough control in your work. You might feel like you don't have any autonomy. Maybe you have a manager who is micromanaging you and trying to control every little thing that you do. That can be really frustrating. There can be disconnections of rewards. Maybe you don't feel like you're being compensated well enough for the work that you're doing, or maybe you feel like you're not being recognized by your team. You might feel that you're not being treated fairly within your workplace. Maybe you feel like there's opportunities that your colleagues are getting that you deserve also, but you're just not being given a chance. That can be tough to deal with. A disconnection of values is something that a lot of people seem to be thinking about these days. If you don't agree with you know, the way that your company does business, if you just don't see eye to eye with you know, your team or your manager, it can be really hard to get up and continue to go to work every day to look at yourself in the mirror in the morning when you just fundamentally disagree with your company's values. You might also feel that you don't have a community in your workplace, that you are, you know, maybe you're a one-person team at a small startup, or maybe you just don't really get along with any of your colleagues. Any or all of these factors can contribute to feelings of burnout. When I was feeling really burnt out a few years ago, I was struggling with all of these areas and I identified another couple factors that were being really important for me at that point. I felt like I was disconnected from the industry. So this is similar to community, but I think it goes a little beyond that, beyond your individual workplace. If you don't feel like you are welcome in the tech industry as a whole, if you don't see 
people who look like you being successful in your field, it can be hard to wonder, you know, where is my career going to go? I also felt that I was being kind of disconnected from my idea of myself. So I spent many years being, you know, the only woman in engineering, or I was a one-person ops team. For years, I was the only person in the little startups that I was working at who did operations. And feeling like I was the only person at work who cared about the work that I was doing, or feeling like I had to laugh at sexist jokes just to, you know, be part of the team, it really wore on me after a while. So feeling like you can't be your genuine self at work can really contribute to burnout as well. So again, burnout, we're not just talking about being stressed out or overworked, but we're talking about this feeling of disconnection between you and your work. And when we're looking at burnout, we're seeing a lack of efficacy, increased cynicism, and exhaustion. So when I get burnt out, I'm very cynical, and I'm just like, well, everything is terrible, and why bother fixing it? Like, I just don't have the energy to try and make things better. And that's not great. So the opposite of this, how do, we, how do we come back from this? If burnout is caused by feeling disconnected, we want to try and create connections to bring people back to a place of engagement where they can be effective and optimistic and have energy to try and solve problems. A big part of what helped me stay in the tech industry was this idea of DevOps and how it was able to create connections in between people. So instead of being the only person at a company who cared about operations, who was doing ops work, I started to find people on Twitter who were doing operations as well. I started getting introduced to the DevOps Days series of conferences. Breaking down silos between, you know, dev and ops teams was really great for, you know, the industry overall, for companies overall but it's also good for people who are then able to connect with other people like them and get more engaged. We can learn from each other when we have these connections. And a big part of what makes this work is this idea of empathy. So empathy allows developers to understand why ops people are so concerned about the servers and whether or not the servers are up. Empathy allows ops people to have empathy for why the developers want to get code out the door faster. It allows us to overcome the, you know, different goals that we might have otherwise. So in our book, Jennifer Davis and I came up with what we describe as our four pillars of effective DevOps. We did a bunch of research, we did formal and informal case studies, and we found that organizations that were doing DevOps most effectively shared these four characteristics. So we have collaboration, individual people working together with shared interactions and input building towards a common goal. And right here, we're talking about a t common team goal. These are usually people on the same team working together, which might sound very basic, but if you have people on the same team who can't work well together, it's unlikely that you're going to have people on different teams able to work together well at all. Next up, we have affinity. So this is talking about now inter-team relationships in between teams, building up empathy and trust in support of now shared organizational and business goals. And this is what people typically think of when they think of DevOps, is you know, the affinity between the dev team and the ops team. We have tools, of course. But Jennifer and I view tools not as you know, which tool you use being the most important, but rather we, we view them as accelerators of culture that, if used correctly, can help to enhance and support collaboration and affinity in between people and in between teams. Tools reinforce culture, but they do not replace it. The best tools in the world will not fix a broken culture. The example that I like to give on this is if you have a company where people are refusing to talk to each other, if they just won't share information, switching from HipChat to Slack or whatever is not going to fix that because there's underlying issues that are not specific to the tools that you're using. So as awesome as Slack is, 
it's not going to fix any sort of underlying systemic problems that you might have, so that's something important to keep in mind when you're thinking about tool usage. We also have scaling. And when we talk about scaling, we're talking about not some enterprise DevOps that is somehow different from regular DevOps, because that's not a real thing. But we're talking about throughout an organization's life cycle, how to use the other three pillars throughout these various inflection points as your organizations grow and change. Got to get my cat picture count up so I can, you know, maybe beat Toria. Ultimately, DevOps is about bridging the differences in between people and in between teams that can make our organizations less effective. You can bridge differences in between people who might not see eye to eye or teams who have different goals. You can bridge differences between you and your customers to enable you to help solve their problems better. So I'm going to look now at some ways that we at Etsy have tried to create connections throughout our engineering organization and throughout our company as a whole in the hopes that some of these ideas might work for you and your organizations. So when people start at Etsy, we have a program that we call boot camps, which is not anything involving push-ups or anything military like that. We're just having people start working on teams that are not the teams that they got hired for. So for example, somebody who starts on the operations team might do a boot camp with the security team because our ops and security teams work really closely together. These usually last between one and six weeks, depending on people's schedules and interest. People are making meaningful contributions to these other teams. They're not just sitting around reading documentation. And this gives them a really deep understanding of these teams that, might, that they might end up working closely with. They get to know and they get to work with more people. And this creates empathy and interconnectedness, especially as your organization grows. It's one thing when you have a small startup where everyone can fit in the same room to get to know everybody else in the company. But when your company is, you know, hundreds or thousands of people, you're not going to get to know people as organically. So a program like this can help foster those connections that might not appear otherwise. Because we do this when people start at the very beginning, it's less disruptive to their own teams because they're brand new and they're not in the middle of projects that they then have to put on hold. Now, we don't want to limit the benefits of this sort of program to just when people start, so we do what we call senior rotations, where once a year you can spend a month doing a longer rotation onto another team within engineering. Again, you're making more meaningful contributions and gaining a deeper understanding. Usually people will dive into one pretty big project for the month that they're rotating. This leads to greater engagement and retention, as engineers, as software developers, we often have a variety of interests, and working on the same team for years might not be that interesting. So senior rotations allow people to explore interests that they might not get a chance to otherwise. We talk about operations a lot at Etsy, and we have this program, or we used to have this program called Designated Ops that allowed us to scale out our ops team and help it better serve the rest of the engineering organization. So I, for example, was a designated point of contact for our Hadoop team. What this looked like is I would attend their weekly team meetings or their project meetings. This would allow us to identify operational concerns early on. So for example, if the API team was putting together some new endpoints that were going to increase the load on our API cluster, the designated ops for that team could help them do capacity planning to make sure that they had the hardware in place ahead of time. We can do more proactive monitoring this way. So I have this story that I like to tell from several jobs ago. One day I was sitting at my desk doing computering and the CEO comes up to me and he said, Catherine, this new site is down. Why aren't you fixing it? And unfortunately my response was, sorry, what new site are you talking about? Because somehow the development team had developed a new site, deployed it, put it in front of customers, and it went down without anyone even telling the ops team that this was happening. We couldn't monitor something that we didn't know existed. So with the designated ops program, 
we can learn what is going on, what new features and products are being developed before they go into production, so that our customers are not the ones telling us that you know, something is on fire. We can also share operational understanding with other teams. So I can teach these teams you know, how to write a chef recipe or how to add uh, monitoring to their services, which means that they can start to do this themselves instead of me being a bottleneck or the ops team being a bottleneck. When we were doing this, we had designated ops engineers for nearly every team within the engineering org. Unfortunately, this doesn't scale infinitely as the number of you know, engineering teams grows. So this is just one model of you know, sharing operational concerns with the rest of the organization. We were designated points of contact. We were building relationships with these teams, but we weren't dedicated to them. I was not dedicated to doing only work for our Hadoop team. You can also do this with security. We call them our designated hackers. You can do this with design. Any, any team within your organization that has skills that can benefit a wide group of teams can benefit from a program like this. So we have knowledge sharing going both ways. You know, I can teach the Hadoop team about Chef and Nagios. They can also teach me about Hadoop, which because we're in this ongoing designated ops relationship makes me better at helping them out in the future. We have, again, this increased visibility and communication, and this leads to more collaboration and more empathy in between various engineering teams. Another big thing that we try and do is have a culture of transparency as much as we can. So team meetings and planning meetings are open to anyone who wants to join. We generally have public meeting agendas so that people can just say, oh, is there something interesting being discussed this week that might be relevant to me? Architecture reviews, the way that we decide if we are going to make big changes to our architecture, these are open. Operability reviews, the reviews that we have before something goes into production, these are open as well. Uh, like Jason said this morning, having everyone in the company being able to see your postmortems can have a lot of benefits. So we have open postmortems, and we find this is actually really beneficial because somebody who is not connected to a team or an incident will come in and they'll ask a question because they don't have the same context, and that question will make us think about things in new ways that we wouldn't have before, and then we learn more. And really, our postmortems are all about what can we learn. We have open mailing lists, anyone can join, open Slack channels, really as much as we can. And, you know, we're a public company, so there are some restrictions about, like, what data can and can't be visible to everyone. But as much as we can, we want to have things open so that people can be connected and find out as much information as is relevant to them. There are also things that we do at Etsy to try and connect not just the engineering organization, but really the entire business. Like, engineering is important. You know, the people who create and operate our platforms are super important to Etsy, but they are not the entire company. So one thing that we do is we have non-engineering rotations. The example that I like to give for this is a customer support rotation. Now, this is a lot shorter than our, you know, senior rotations or our boot camps. It's usually a few hours to a day where engineers will help out the customer support team. And they'll usually be helping out with pretty basic level tasks, you know, the IT help desk equivalent of, have you tried turning it off and on again? We're not going to put our engineers in front of really complex customer problems. But what we want is to give engineers a view of how people are using the things that they're building. Most of our engineers are not people who are making their living selling things on Etsy.com, though we do encourage our engineers to go through the process of opening an Etsy shop to see what it's like. But we are not our customers, so having these customer support rotations allows us to have more empathy for our customers, for our users, and also for you know, the customer support staff and what they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Throughout the or entire company, as much as we can, we have shared tools and processes. We want to have a shared chat system. We used to use IRC. A few months ago, we ended up migrating to Slack because we found that engineers found IRC a lot friendlier than non-engineers who could have seen that coming. <laughs> and we found that we have greater communication throughout the entire company when we're on a platform like Slack. 
we have shared ticketing systems. Every team uses JIRA, which again might sound pretty straightforward, but I have worked at companies before where every single team had its own ticketing system, so the dev team couldn't see what the ops team was doing because they didn't have permission to use, you see, even see each other's ticketing systems. It wasn't great. We also have shared processes for things like postmortems. So for example, one time we had a lunch brought in that did not sit well with people's stomachs, and we had a postmortem for that that followed the exact same process as that one time that I took down the site, which makes it really easy to you know, interact with other parts of the company because we're all following the same procedures. We're also remembering that we want to focus on the customers because ultimately what we're doing is we're trying to solve problems for our customers. Jeff Susna in 2014 wrote a blog post called Empathy, the Essence of DevOps. And he said, empathy allows software makers and operators to help each other deliver the best possible functionality and operability on behalf of their customers. I think we can go a little bit further than that. And we can say that empathy allows organizations to help each other deliver the best possible solutions on behalf of their customers, because remember, it's not just about engineers. DevOps was about breaking down this silo or this wall of distrust of different goals in between dev and ops. And I think it's important that when we're thinking about this, we don't also create an accidental wall in between engineers and non-engineers. I think really it's about finding as many ways as possible to support each other and connect each other throughout the entire organization. You know, our customer support staff sees firsthand how our customers are using our products, if there's anything that they're struggling with. And when we have connections with them, we're able to then make our products better. So the more people feel included within your organization, the more effective your organization and the business are going to be. So we can take one step backward again, go out a little bit and say, how can we move from creating these inclusive organizations to creating an inclusive industry? We're talking about inclusivity a lot these days, but there are still people who say, well, you know, we don't have a diversity problem here. I think it's easy to say that inclusivity isn't a problem if you're already being included. If you're in a meeting at work and you look around the room and you're surrounded by people who look like you, yeah, you're probably going to pe feel pretty safe and pretty included, but you know, that's not true for all of us. So I think it's important to think about you know, who is being included in our meetings, in our conferences, in our conversations. So I said that DevOps was about creating connections and about creating empathy. Empathy allows people to create, to help each other create the most inclusive industry on behalf of everyone working in it. So we can help make this industry one where everyone feels safe, where everyone feels that you know, they can get up on a stage and tell their story, where they can write a blog post and share what they've learned with people. Empathy is kind of what ties our four pillars of effective DevOps together. It allows us to embrace and learn from our differences in order to create these working environments that are truly collaborative and creative. Writer and civil rights activist Audre Lorde, when talking about difference and diversity, said, difference must be not merely tolerated, but seen as a fund of necessary polarities between which our creativity can spark like a dialectic. We need to be using differences to enhance our creativity. We shouldn't pretend that differences don't exist. So the next time you're in a meeting, you know, ask yourself, how are differences, how are different opinions treated? Do people get made fun of for suggesting something that somebody else doesn't agree with? I've certainly been in meetings where that has happened, not at Etsy, thankfully, but back in previous lives. Or do people not have differing opinions? Does nobody just, does nobody speak up? And this could be that people are afraid to speak up, or maybe you have just such a homogenous group of people that everyone has the same opinion, and they're like, yep, we have the idea, it is the good idea, we're done. That's not the most creative that we can be. So it's important that we ask ourselves, how do we solve problems? 
how are we using our creativity to solve problems for our users? But also, what problems are we solving? I see a lot of stories of startups coming out of Silicon Valley these days that are essentially like your parents as a service. You know, people who are like, I don't want to do my own laundry, so I'll have a service do it. Or I don't want to cook my own dinner, so I'll have a service do it. I see a lot of that, and I feel like maybe with everything that's going on in the world, these aren't the most important problems that we, as this group of, you know, smart and creative and talented engineers, could be solving. Ultimately, what we are doing is trying to use technology to solve problems for people. We're trying to make people's lives better. Technology is not the end goal itself. I don't argue with computers every day because I enjoy it. I argue with computers because I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, trying, trying to help solve problems for our customers. <clears throat> so DevOps creates effective businesses by building bridges in between teams. It also creates effective solutions by building these bridges in between people. If 56% of women leave the industry halfway into their careers, how much creativity are we losing? So we can use empathy to help create and enhance connections between all of us so that we all feel safe and included in this industry. So I would ask you to be inclusive, to break down silos in between your teams, and to build bridges so that we can all be the most creative and most empathetic problem solvers and engineers that we can be. Thank you.